Tonight we're pleased to have Anita Baumgars present The Spirit Lake Massacre, Resisters, Adapters, and Adopters. The 1850s frontier in Northwest Iowa contained people groups who were adopters, adapters, and resistors to the inevitable change that was coming to the region. In a continuation of the Spirit Lake Massacre story, Anita will focus on how these three personality types contributed to the tensions of a culture that would be forever transfigured. I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Anita, and her interests which have contributed to tonight's presentation. As Anita related, she's always been a lover of history that was promoted by her family of storytellers. She also graduated from Northwestern College with a history minor. She has enticed her husband Dave and several local friends to join her in exploring Abby's paths from the lake shore of Okaboji to Smithland and Sioux Rapids, Iowa, Jackson and Pipestone, Minnesota, Flandreau and Redfield, South Dakota, and back to Fort Ridgely, Minnesota, meeting many colorful characters along the way. She is most inspired to know more about Abby Gardner's story by spending time amongst the tall oak trees at Pillsbury Park on Lake Okoboji. Anita currently serves as president of the Friends of Abby Gardner Cabin Historic Site. She is involved in the restoration of the historic site's existing facilities and monuments, working with the state of Iowa to preserve the legacy of Abby Gardner and early new Iowa settlers and the displaced indigenous peoples of our region. Let's welcome Anita Baumgars. Thanks, so. Al. Thank you too to the Dutch American Heritage Museum Board for inviting me to visit with you tonight. As a wise minister said in a local church, just a couple days ago, history is totally dependent on the bookends. So tonight we're gonna to explore the bookends of what I consider to be the large story of the Spirit Lake Massacre. We're gonna be taking a look, like uh, Al said, at the three different groups, the adapters, adopters, and resistors. We're gonna see what their responses were to what happened to them during that time. So I'd like you all to be thinking about this as we go through the whole visit here tonight. It's happened to you, and I'm sure it has. The most life-changing event you can ever think of has happened. Your family has moved to a new location. Someone you loved dearly has passed on. Your body has changed dramatically by an illness or an accident. All the circumstances of the new life around you are foreign. You are forced to leave everything familiar behind and begin again. Can you move on with life? What will you choose? Tonight I'm being assisted here in technology by Isaac and Nick, so I don't have to stress about that as we move along, so thanks guys. So several things became apparent to me as I spent five years researching this specific historical event. Number one, I soon came to realize history is always messy. There are so many different dimensions to one single story that you really need to spend a lot of time and explore each of those events. And number two, People involved in a crisis choose one of three attitudes to cope with their changed lives. Tonight, I want you to think about three particular people whose lives were then greatly affected by the Spirit Lake Massacre. All three had to make choices on how to move forward from that very tragic Sunday of March 8, 1857. In closely examining these three characters, I soon did recognize an adapter, an adopter, and a resistor. Let me take you back to a bleak afternoon in the horribly severe winter 
Abby's Journey, 1857. It was a horrible winter, but the calendar was suggesting spring was on its way. The gardeners had just moved into a Dickinson County cabin Roland and Francis Gardner had built beside the lake native people called Okoboji, a place of rest. Along with a string of other pioneer families on the lakeshore, the gardeners tried to survive that winter. The closest settlement was Fort Dodge, a long trek east. On March 8, 1857, in a log cabin in the cold, the Gardner family was visited by a band of Wapakuti Santee, who, with other native bands, had been forced off their homelands by Euro-American settlements into supposed neutral land in northwest Iowa between the Little Sioux and Big Sioux rivers. The Wapakutis were led by Ink Paduta, a headman who nursed grievances he'd carried from the time his brother and family were murdered by a white man who was never punished for his crimes. Death broke into the cabin that late winter morning. Abby Gardner's father and mother, her brother Roly, her sister Mary, as well as Mary's baby girl and young son were all slaughtered mercilessly before Abby's eyes by Ink Paduta's band. I was dragged from the never-to-be-forgotten scene, Abby wrote years later in a memoir, no language can ever suggest, much less portray, my feelings. She was herself taken captive, along with three other women abducted in subsequent attacks. After three long months of horrifying captivity, after the murders of two other captive women, Mrs. Noble, as well as Abby's friend Mrs. Thatcher, two Yankton rescuers purchased her freedom. She was 13 years old. By her own confession, her healing required a lifetime. Eventually, she returned to the lakes area, ironically, to the cabin where she suffered so much horror. She wrote a memoir about her life's sadness, even sold copies at the old family cabin. Ink Peduta went on to live his life as a blanket native, pushing back against Euro-American settlements invading the region and looking over his shoulder to avoid capture. He was never imprisoned or lived on a reservation, and lived out his years protected by Native people who honored him. He died in Canada. When Abby Gardner in later years visited the Santees at Flandreau, South Dakota, she experienced the kind of reconciliation we all dream of when she stood in community with newfound Santee friends at a place so close to the Big Sioux River that she claimed she could see the place where her friend, Mrs. Thatcher, had been brutally murdered 35 years earlier. The past and present scenes rose up and passed before me like a living, moving panorama, she wrote in her memoir. It was, she said, truly marvelous, her day of realization. Amazing as it seems, that reconciliation is yet today in the epigraph on her cemetery stone at the cabin. Orphaned and enslaved by hostile Sioux, she lived to embrace in Christian benevolence the American Indian and all mankind. So I would like to publicly thank Jim Scott for his narration and for his um, writing for the video that he gifted to our friends group. This can be found on YouTube. So there's times when we're in a meeting and we need to explain what the Spirit Lake Massacre was all about and we've got this four minute YouTube to uh, find and, and use, it's great. So as a basis for what we're talking about tonight, you've been introduced to the story. The deadly confrontation between the societies of natives and Euro settlers in Northwest Iowa gives us a perfect example of the personalities I want to focus on. The last time I spoke with you, we talked about the young captive girl, Abby Gardner. 
Tonight, I will be expanding that story to include two other men, both of who played pivotal roles in the regional conflict here from 1857 through the Battle of Little Bighorn nearly 20 years later in 1876. All three represent ways to survive on the prairie. Let me introduce you to our first character, Charles Flandreau. Charles Flandreau, French or Flandreau, Dutch, and since I'm Dutch, we're gonna call him Flandreau, and actually he went by that most of his life, came from a French Huguenot family that settled in New York. He was truly born with a silver spoon in his mouth. In 1680, his family immigrated from the Netherlands to New York State. The Flandreau family was gifted with a plethora of colonial leaders, politicians, and very high achievers. His future was paved with a promising career in his father's law firm, where he would be joining a practice whose former partner, Aaron Burr, had become quite famous for mm, a little bit of a public duel he fought with Thomas Jefferson's vice president. However, this life didn't seem to hold enough adventure for the young Flandreau. He instead chose to go to sea as just a common sailor for three years, then came back and practiced law until 1853, and finally left the practice for the Wild West to assuage his adventurous side. He landed in Minnesota Territory in 1853 at the age of 25 and embraced frontier life. Charles soon took up the kind of life a man can only dream of. Those were his words. Let's listen to an excerpt from Flandreau's book entitled The History of Minnesota and Tales from the Frontier. It's read in LibriVox recordings. Delighted to do anything or go anywhere that promised work or adventure. It was to me that the Klondike has been to thousands recently. They furnished me with a good team and away I went. It was in the winter, but I succeeded in reaching Traverse de Sioux, where I found a collection of Indian trading houses where flourished Louis Roberts, Major Forbes, Nathan Myrick, Madison Sweetser, and others who drove a trade with the Sioux. There was also at this point a missionary station with a schoolhouse a church and a substantial dwelling house occupied by the Reverend Moses Ann Adams, who had been a missionary among the Sioux, having been transferred from the station at La Kiparl, where he had lived for many years to this point. But the best find that I made was a young Scotchman by the name of Stuart B. Garvey, who had a shanty on the prairie about midway between Traverse de Sioux and my objective point, Rock Bend. I think that Garvey went up there from St. Anthony under some kind of a promise from Judge Chatfield that if ever the courts were organized in that region, he would be made the clerk. Garvey was delighted to discover me, and I being in search of information, we soon fraternized and he agreed to go with me on my tour of exploration. We went up the Blue Earth, the Lesur, the Wantonwin, and in fact visited all the country that was necessary to convince me that it was, by and large, a splendid agricultural region, and I decided so to report to my principals. When I was about to leave for down the river, Garvey insisted that I should return and take up my abode at Traverse de Sioux. The proposition seemed too absurd to me to be seriously entertained, and I said, I am destitute of funds. How can a lawyer subsist where there are no people? How can I get a living? This dilemma, which seemed to me to be insuperable, was easily answered by my newfound friend. Why, he said, that is the easiest part of it. We can hunt a living, and I have a shack and a bed. The proposition was catching, having a spice of adventure in it, and I promised to consider it. After making my report, in which I recommended Rock Bend as a promising place for a great city, I told the parties who proposed to purchase Captain Dodd's claim that I would confirm my faith in the success of the enterprise by returning and living at the point. I did so and found myself farther west than any lawyer in the United States east of the Rocky Mountains, unless he was in the panhandle of Texas. And now comes the singular way in which I made my first fee, if I may call it by that name. It was my first financial raise. 
no matter what you call it. Garvey and I had gotten quietly settled in our shanty on the prairie when one excessively cold night an Indian boy, about 13 years of age, saw our light and came to the door, giving us to understand that his people were encamped about four or five miles up the river and that he was afraid to go any further lest he should freeze to death. He was mounted on a pony, had a pack of furs with him, and asked us to take him in for the night. We of course did so and made him as comfortable as we could by giving him a buffalo robe on the floor. But we had no shelter for his pony and all we could do was to hitch him on the lee side of the shanty and strap a blanket on him. When morning came, he was frozen to death. We got the poor little boy safely off on the way to his people's camp and decided to utilize the carcass of the pony for a wolf bait. In order to present an intelligent idea of the situation, I will say that the river made an immense detour in front of the future town, having a large extent of bottomland covered with a dense chaparral, which was the home of thousands of wolves. And as soon as night came, they would start out in droves in search of prey. We hauled the dead pony out to the back of the shanty and left it about two rods distant from the window. The moment night set in, the wolves in packs would attack the carcass. At first, we would step outside and fire into them with buckshot from double-barreled shotguns. But we found they were so wary that the mere movement of opening the door to get out would frighten them and we had very limited success for the first few nights. Another difficulty we encountered was shooting in the dark. If you have never tried it and ever do, you will find it exceedingly difficult to get any kind of an aim, and you have to fire promiscuously at the sound rather than the object. We remedied this trouble, however, by taking out a light of glass from the back window and building a rest that bore directly on the carcass so that we could poke our guns through the opening settle them on the rest, and blaze away into the gloom. We brought our bed up to the window so that we could shoot without getting out of it while snugly wrapped up in our blankets. After this, our luck improved, and after each discharge, we would rush out, armed with a tomahawk, dispatch the wounded wolves, and collect the dead ones until we had slaughtered 42 of them. We skinned them and sold the pelts to the traders for 75 cents apiece, which money was the first of our earnings. It was not long before we ceased to depend on wolf hunting for a living as immigration soon poured in and money became plenty. I remember soon after of having $1,700 in gold buried in an oyster can under the shanty. I lived on this prairie for 11 years and never was happier at any period of my life and feel assured that I can safely say that no other man ever enjoyed the luxury of hunting wolves in bed. <laughs> that was a long ways from New York City. So as he said, he soon took up the kind of life a man can only dream of. And he uh, continued to seek adventure, Flandreau did, as an explorer, a trader of furs, and a practicing attorney, literally at the same time. After serving on the Minnesota Territorial Council and helping to write the Minnesota Constitution, he was appointed as a U.S. agent for the Lower Sioux Agency in 1856. It was Charles Flandreau who refused to give any reparations in the form of food to the Dakota people who had not signed the Treaty of 1851. In that treaty, the Sisseton Wahpeton Dakota people received $1,665,000 for 21 million acres of land. That was 7.5 cents an acre. The land ceded and sold to the U.S. government by the Dakota people included the extreme northwest part and north central parts of Iowa. One of the non-signees Charles refused to give food to was the Sioux renegade named Ink Paduta. Flander was called into leadership in the future rescue of the massacre captives. Because of his policy of no sign the treaty, no food, he blamed himself for the tragedy at Okoboji. He tried to advise the military contingency that went into action from Fort Ridgely in an attempt to find Ink Paduta and his captives. 
Unfortunately, the contingency of, of soldiers that left Fort Ridgely, and it re kind of reminded me of F Troop, remember that old story? <laughs> yeah, Fort Ridgely and F Troop were probably the same thing. That um, leader outfitted his, his men as if they were going to fight a southern battle in March, so needless to say it was a disaster. Charles was very active in personally arranging the bartering to free both Mrs. Marble and Abby. Flandreau even personally financed Abby's release. Many years later, Charles supported and contributed to Abby Gardner when she was writing her memoirs. Charles then becomes our example of an adopter. He loved and embraced his frontier life and spent the rest of his years in his adopted home of Minnesota. Our next featured character, Ink Paduta, couldn't be more opposite of Charles Flandreau. Ink Paduta, a Wapatan Sisseton Sioux, was reportedly born in Minnesota in the early 1800s. He made his home between the Minnesota, Des Moines, and Missouri rivers in a territory he understood to be neutral. Known as fierce warriors, Ink Paduta and his brother were constantly trained in the art of war by their Dakota family. Until the mid-1800s, most of the battles fought in our region had been between the various groups of natives. But by the mid-1800s, our area, Northwest Iowa, was known to be inhabited solely by the Dakota Sioux and fur traders. Ink Paduta was nomadic and traveled with the seasons. His family spent some winters on the east side of the Los Hills near Smithland and summers at Lake Okoboji. Hunting for game was anywhere in between those two locations, usually around the Little and Big Sioux Rivers. In a skirmish with a horse thief, Henry Lott, which occurred north of Fort Dodge, Ink Paduta's brother, Cinnamon Aduta, and his family, minus two children, were killed and stuffed into a frozen river. After his brother's body was discovered, an attorney nailed Cinnamon Aduta's head to the doorpost of his home. Two of Cinnamon Aduta's children, both English-speaking Josh Paduta and Umpashata, who had um, hid during the attack on their family, went on to stay with a settler's family. Ink Paduta reported the killing of his brother's family to the U.S. attorney authorities in the area, but those authorities never apprehended Henry Lott. Ink Paduta and his brother, Cinnamon Aduta, being non-signees, never ceded any of their hunting ground to the U.S. government. In the winters of 1856 and 57 at Smithland, Ink Paduta and the women from his family group were accused of stealing corn from the farmers. There was a totally different understanding of what the earth provided and who could take the benefits from the earth. And Ink Paduta and his uh, family understood that if you could dig it up from the earth, it was there for you to eat. Where, of course, the farmers with their European ideas came in and said, no, that's my land. I planted the corn. <clears throat> As a consequence, this had been his only means of survival, and then they confiscated the last thing that was going to allow them to live, and that was his guns. They were taken from him. He was driven out of the area by Smithland and watched helplessly as his young grandson starved to death. Ink Paduta soon began his venge-filled trek up the Little Sioux River Valley toward the Spirit Lakes. Ink Paduta, then, is our resistor. Our third character, my adapter, is Abigail Gardner. Abby's father, Roland, was lured into the Okoboji region with a sale bill that promised fertile farmland, beautiful lakes, mild winters, and no more Indian conflicts. <laughs> now, this painting called Westward might look a little familiar to most of you. It is in the Iowa Capitol building. It was commissioned and serves as a reminder of the glorification of manifest destiny. When you look at that painting, who wouldn't want to have traveled out west? The angels were blessing you as you went along. You were able to reap harvest from the ground. Everybody was in good health. Everybody looked wholesome and ready to conquer the world. Manifest destiny. Roland Gardner 
homesteaded or possibly squatted actually on neutral territory in the shores of Lake Okoboji in the summer of 1856. Neutral territory meaning the land belonged to no one and everyone. Roland's youngest daughter, Abby, was 12 or 13. Abby and her siblings were educated by their mother, a devout Methodist. The children spent a delightful summer exploring their new environment. Abby's family brought new farming techniques and domesticated farm animals to the Okoboji region, but also enjoyed fishing at the lake and finding indigenous berries. They had homesteaded too late in the summer to plant a garden or crops and relied on the local cuisine or brought food, bought food from Fort Dodge on which to subsist. Abby's older sister Eliza was deemed capable enough to assist a doctor's family in Springfield, Minnesota, now called Jackson, and was not with the rest of the family when the attack occurred. As you may have discerned, the weather that winter became a large factor in that story. Beginning in December and lasting through April, it is still documented as the worst Minnesota winter in history. Even as March arrived, the snow and the cold were fierce. Hunting game was disappearing from the region. The last bison and elk in Iowa left during this time. Nearest food and medicine were hundreds of miles away in Fort Dodge and St. Paul. Everyone was rationing and praying for spring. Without going into redundant detail, the resistor in Paduta, adapter Abby Gardner, and adopter Charles Flandreau were drawn together into a macabre scene of revenge, terror, and guilt on that cold, bloody Sunday afternoon on the shores of Lake Okoboji. The event, forever to be known as the Spirit Lake Massacre, was actually premeditated. <clears throat> this was verified by nephew and niece Josh Paduta um Ampashata. Years later, when Ampashata was asked to marry um, a white settler, she said, I cannot marry you because I knew what my uncle was going to do. I knew there would be deaths to white people. And Josh Paduta, when he left the cabin of the settler family taking care of him, turned around and said to the woman, you need to leave, there will be killings. An estimated 43 lives were taken of women, men, and children and they captured and kidnapped the four women of childbearing age, which was very much uh, how you handled um, taking captives back in that day amongst the natives. Following this forever life-changing incident, our three main characters are brought to the forefront of American history. Ink Paduta, the apparent victor, was forever to be a hunted man. Abigail Gardner, a captive at the mercy of Ink Paduta and the elements of nature, had to call on her strength of mind to move on with life. Charles Flandreau, pushed into a position of leadership in a world that knew little civility, needed to rely on his wisdom, education, and endurance to deal with the crisis and conquer new frontiers. Following the deaths of two of the captive women, the bartered release of one other, Abby, now all alone, was sold to Christianized Sisseton Sioux men who had been privately funded by Lower Sioux agent Flandreau. For Abby's life was going to be filled with what we now know as post-traumatic stress syndrome. Freed from the Indians, she, now a tainted woman according to the society of that day, at age 13, was married two months after her captivity. She bore three children, one dying at 18 months. Abby was burned out of two homes, became estranged from her one remaining sister, survived a permanent separation from her husband, and suffered with mental and physical ailments and deep depression for many years. Abby was befriended by Reverend Pillsbury and his wife. The Pillsburys homesteaded near her parents' cabin and provided her with a safe and hospitable place to stay when she visited the uh, home site. Abby also developed a very special bond with her reading room sisters in Spirit Lake. Together they studied the Christian science religion of healing through scripture. Abby as an adult went on to finally receive a good measure of mental, physical, and spiritual healing. However, one task remained. She needed to complete her healing journey by going to visit the very people who probably had killed her family. In September of 1892, she drove in her buggy from Okoboji 
into Minnesota to South Dakota, where she spoke to the native Presbyterian Episcopal Church in Flandreau, ministered by Reverend John Eastman. You saw a picture of that church. Their pastor, Reverend John Eastman, was a Sisseton native from a prominent family with many descendants still living in the Flandreau, South Dakota area today. On that Sunday afternoon, speaking in a church filled with possibly some of the very people who killed her family, Abby was able to bring them a message of forgiveness, friendship, and well wishes for their future. This began an acceptance and an appreciation of the native life she had been introduced to and an understanding of what her future could be. Abby then went on to write and publish her memoirs in her autobiography, The Spirit Lake Massacre. There's some copies over there tonight. And that actually is scheduled to go into its 16th printing come this fall. I'll tell you a little more at the end of my talk about those. This allowed her to buy back her family cabin and land with market and narrate her story for school children all over our region. She charged 10 cents for admission and guess what our state archaeologist found right next to the cabin last summer? 10 cents. Abby also presented programs about her experience within our region. She was a shrewd businesswoman. Notice how she covered the whole cabin with lattice, so you actually had to pay your admission, go underneath so you could peek at the cabin, which parts of the cabin are still original to this day. Abby went on to temporarily live in Des Moines, where she spent days petitioning the Iowa legislature to erect a monument honoring those who had died and given their lives in rescue of the captive women. Abigail Gardner, one of the first female entrepreneurs in Iowa, she adapted. Charles Flandro became fully engaged in Minnesota politics in early statehood. He directed several campaigns to catch and punish Ink Paduta, but only realized the death of one of Ink Paduta's twin sons for his efforts. Colonel Flandreau was hastily selected to lead the U.S. Cavalry in efforts to save 1,000 southern Minnesota refugees in the New Ulm village from promised death in 1862 in the southern Minnesota Dakota uprising. Colonel Flandreau led them in a daring nighttime escape from a large group of Dakota Sioux men. The, men were, the Dakota Sioux men were bent on eliminating settlers from Minnesota while the rest of the U.S. military was preoccupied fighting in the Civil War. Colonel Flandreau, who later joked he should have commissioned himself as a general because the governor allowed him to pick his own rank, served on the Minnesota Supreme Court, practiced law, became a Minnesota historian. Charles adopted frontier life and robustly centered the remainder of his life, his years, on his beloved newly formed state. Then there's Ink Paduta. Marked and hunted as a vicious killer, he would need to look over his shoulder for the remainder of his life. Fearful of capture and revenge, and especially of having that turned on his family, he was forever fleeing. Historians now commonly believe he was a strategical mind behind many of the frontier attacks in the mid to latter 1800s in our region. He had a fierce love and sense of protection for his family of 10 children, which included two sets of twin sons. One twin son, Roaring Cloud, was singled out and killed, as I mentioned, as punishment for his involvement at Okaboji. Another younger twin son, reportedly by Dakota and Lakota people, killed General Custer. Following Little Bighorn, Ink Paduta fled from the Dakotas into Canada. Ink Paduta was a friend of Sitting Bull and was probably involved in the strategy behind the Southern Minnesota uprising in 1862. Ink Paduta spent life suffering with bad eyesight and a badly smallpox scarred face but had a keen, strategic, and oftentimes devious mind, which terrorized our region. He never signed a treaty. He never was captured and never was finished, physically punished for his participation in the Spirit Lake Massacre or other atrocities. He died in Canada. To this day, his Dakota offspring rarely identify as being a part of his lineage. Ink Paduta was a resistor to the end of his days. So. Let's just stop and reflect on our grandparents, many of who founded the towns here in Northwest Iowa.
My bet is you can think of examples of all three personality types we've talked about. My great-grandfather, Peter Nusma, a Dutch Michigan immigrant to North Dakota, was an adopter. He thrived on being a cowboy, cattle boy, buyer, and horse trader. He spoke five languages, Dutch, German, Russian, Lakota, and English. His wife, my great-grandmother, raised nine children, starting in a sod hut. She was often alone as her husband spent months away. Every summer, she tried to grow Michigan flowers in the hot summer climate of North Dakota. Reportedly, she never smiled. Great-grandmother Nusma was a resistor. <laughs> then the adapter, their grandmother, I mean my grandmother, their daughter, my grandmother Sadie Nusma Plantage. Sadie could not wait to flee harsh North Dakota. Actually, Lawrence Walk was their next door neighbor and worked for my great-grandfather. Anyway, she took her first chance when she saw a young gentleman come along one summer. She quickly married him, and when asked why she married my grandfather, she said, well, he wasn't my first cousin, he wasn't an Indian, he wasn't German, he wasn't Catholic, and was Dutch, so I married him. <laughs> she and Grandpa quickly moved to his newly immigrated brothers in Iowa. Grandma Sadie, the adapter. Finally, my husband Dave and I have been involved with two Colombian families, relatives of our daughter-in-law, who moved into our community one year ago. As we have befriended and mentored them, we have tried to observe life through their eyes. Ripped from the family they loved, a mild equator climate, turning their backs on a successful business, moving into an environment they never thought they would be exposed to, they sought to work with whatever source was given to them. They enrolled their five children in our schools. They found a supportive church community. And most importantly, they managed to survive last winter <laughs> with the help of friends and neighbors. They have become perfect, perfect examples of adapters, or maybe even adopters, to Orange City. Who was right? Who's wrong? Life's complicated. History is messy. Sometimes we do need to be resistors. Other times, it might be more appropriate to be an adapter or most satisfying to be an adopter. Can we learn anything from the lives of this group of regional historical characters? Maybe wisdom then is deciding which choice will lead us to contentment, inner peace, and a better way of life for you and society. So thanks for joining me on this journey tonight as we've explored the juxtaposition of characters as seen in the context of the Spirit Lake Massacre. I did bring along with me um, several copies of Abby's autobiography. Um, she gave those to the Dickens, her, her rights to the Dickinson County Museum many, many years ago, and they gave them to me at cost to sell tonight. And I'm just adding a $2 fee that will go to our museum here. So they're $20 if you're interested. Um, I just wanted to let you know I'm open to questions, and I probably will just give you a real quick little update first. Our work up at the lakes has been um, a labor of love. I have an amazing board who's very involved in making things happen. We um, actually are at the point where the city of Okaboji is now negotiating with the state of Iowa to purchase a lot that is vacant next to the Abbey site, and we hope to build a new interpretive center there in the near future. They don't have a building this lovely. The one that houses Abbey's things right now is we have to take everything out in the winter, and it's just really falling apart. Um, we have the state archaeologists doing digs up there, trying to explore what's under the earth, and we are going to be improving the cabin in the near future. And um, there's just a lot of enthusiasm. It's taken a long time, and it's a lot of red tape. But it's a very worthy story, and it tells the story of Iowa. It tells what happened in the 1850s, why it happened. And I was just sharing with Dr. Anderson that um, I, I said, we, we've discovered now that there are Dakota people hearing our story, and we were asked, what do you think? And they go, that's the way it should be told. So finally, I think we're able to present the whole story in its entirety and let everybody process it as, as they would and should. So thank you so much. I'm open to any questions, or I've got people in this room that could help answer some of them if there's something I don't know. <laughs>
Anything? Yes, David, back there. We had uh, a gentleman at the lakes talk about this exact thing. And the thing that he mentioned was, at the time, it wasn't even homesteadable. That's not a word, but you know, you know what I mean. It wasn't a parcel of land at Okaboge. They actually were just squatting. However, they were not going to punish anybody if there wasn't trouble. If there was no conflict, they'd just let it go. If there was, they'd go ahead and bring in the heavy-duty uh, enforcement and try to solve it. But so they had no clue this was going to happen. They thought so far it was just going to be calm and peaceful. I found that interesting. Yeah, and of course, I think you all know there, every treaty that was made with Native Americans was broken in our country. And as, as the settlers, the Euro settlers, kept moving further and further west, then they would build a new fort to protect them. And then they would go further west, they'd build another fort. So um, yeah, it, it, it was a clash of cultures. Yes? Um, did, so Flandre was the one that freed Abby, or could you talk, did they meet, did they have a relationship? He, the, the, he didn't know Abby, but he knew Ink Paduta, oh. and he felt guilty because he would not give Ink Paduta any food because he didn't sign the treaty. Flanders, the Indian agent, had that right, and he gave all the other Native people who had signed the treaty food, but not Ink Paduta. And because he had some money, <clears throat> he hired, um, there were gentlemen that, from the uh, Sisseton group that had now moved into Flandreau and basically said, hey, can we buy the land? Can we start to farm? And he goes, yeah, you can. So they did. And so there's this little group that started in Flandreau. Oh, there's a name for them. Guys, anybody come up with it? They had their own little republic, something republic that they started. Yeah, I know, we're all going. Anyway, that happened, and he brought them in and said, I want you to go barter her out. And these gentlemen said, it's springtime, we won't plant our crops, we're going to have to get paid because we're just going to be out of crops, and we're risking our lives. If, if they, we go in there to get her, and they went to Redfield, Joe Van Gorp went with me over to Redfield, it's an amazing little spot, like there's the Turtle Creek and the Jim River. There were thousands of natives that would gather there in the summer, and that's where Abby ended up at the end. They had to go into that camp, and they pretended to be, you know, they had full garb on of natives, and she thought for sure she was going to be killed. But they took her out, took her across the river, they had wagons waiting, changed into their garb, and they took her all the way to St. Paul. And they presented her to the governor of the territory at St. Paul, and they were like, I mean, they gave some really great speeches, but they're like, guess what, we need to be paid. And they were. So that, that's how Flandreau was involved. The town Flandreau at first was called Flandreau, and then they changed it to Flandreau if that got confusing. Yes? Were those native? Yes. And the one went on to become a good friend to Abby. Um, okay, I'm trying to think. Over at the lakes, there's one little lake they named after one of them. Wapiton? I think, well, yeah, it could be, it could be the Wapiton area, but yeah. Minnewashita. Thank you, Dave. Minnewashita. That's right. He's been in too much of this. Yes. <laughs> Flandreau, South Dakota. Well, I think is, is it South Dakota? Is it's South Dakota. It's not very far from here. It's about an hour and a half from here. But he was, he was Minnesota. Yeah, it was Minnesota territory, and then it got divided up, and it became part of South Dakota. And um, KSFY, Rhonda pointed out the other night, did a, a special on this little church because it celebrated its 150th anniversary. And I have gotten to be friends with a couple in Flandreau. Um, he, he was a teacher, um, and he's full native, and his wife is a sister to my cousin's wife. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like Dutch bingo. But anyway, um, anyway, they told me, or, or his wife said when she was a little girl, and she said, on, in the summers, if we were late for church, we would just go to the Indian church. We didn't have to wear shoes. We could sit in the aisle. She said, I loved it. But that church has the most fascinating cemetery you will ever see. Right? I, yeah. Yeah, so little. Can you explain what do you mean by that? Um, it's, it's a native cemetery, 
And so the way they, they stage the graves and they, they're descriptive and some of them are just incredibly simple little markers. Um, Jim? Well, the thing that, that I found that, you know, fascinating about it is that they're, they're clearly native um, and often employ native language in the place of Psalm 43, verse 6. <laughs> yeah. And you get it in the book. And yet at the time, as, as you explained, the Santis were essentially converted to Christianity. Yeah. So when yeah. they went there that early already, they were carrying in their own packages um, the gospel. Yeah. Really We've been exploring this whole, the native uprising in southern Minnesota in 1862, and it was horrific. It really was done during the Civil War. It was calculated. This is our only chance to get rid of all the settlers. And they went, swept across, got all, all the way to New Ulm. Almost a thousand settlers were killed. But it's hard to find something redeeming about that. But we were just exploring the fact that the natives they captured were all taken up near St. Paul, Minnesota and held for a period of time. And many of them were exposed to Christianity for the first time and hundreds came out of there and became Christians. There's, that's a whole story, that's a whole other night. <laughs> These two guys can do that one. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, that's right here. It's, it's an hour away. This is who we are. You look at a lot of the things here. They found, like they found that one tool which they date to be 4,000 years old in a field six miles south of Sioux Center. You know, so this was who we are. And um, it's just, it's really a fascinating story to look at and process. So, more questions? Did you ever figure out um, Abby's birth date? It's a little nebulous. That's why we, I say 12 or 13. My, my grandma, the one I told you about, she always fudged on her birth date. <laughs> and we didn't really find that out till she was 90. So, you know, they had their reasons. I don't, I don't think, I think Abby probably always wanted to appear older than because of what she'd been through. Um, if you can imagine her exposure to the native culture and what probably happened to her for two and a half months marked her for her whole life. You know, she was not a part of any of the societal groups up at Okaboji. We've seen less. Abby was never there. Abby poured everything she could into her running the store, telling her story. She bought a lot of land right around her little cabin, loaned a lot of money out to people. Um, you know, we have neighbors at our summer place up there who talk about, she was pretty, pretty hard woman, harsh woman, but she had to wear that veneer. And um, yeah, they said they got in trouble, their grandpa did for stealing apples at her house, things like that. But I don't know, you know, I have not gone to New York State. And a lot of the settlers that came here came across from New York State, interestingly enough. Yeah. So any other thoughts or questions? Or yes? How is it that she was so strange from her Yeah, we we've tr we've tried to discern that. The only thing we can figure is her sister did not know that Abby was alive. Um, there's a whole other story. Her sister was in what was called Springfield. And there was a gentleman who, a, a trapper who went to Abby's cabin right after the atrocity happened, saw all the dead bodies and quickly left. And he went to Springfield and he warned the settlers there, they're coming and you're next. And um, some believed him, some didn't. And he, they did go up there and attack. And her sister uh, did not know Abby was alive. She thought her whole family had been killed. So they fled, they escaped at night, they came down to Fort, toward Fort Dodge. The Fort Dodge group from Webster City and Fort Dodge were going up to rescue them and they actually met in a field and they both thought the other one was gonna attack them. But there was a love interest there. Her sister was in love with another young man from Fort Dodge and she saw him and they met in the field, if you can imagine. But then her sister turned around and sold her parents' cabin to a, hmm, I can't think of the guy's name up there. He's kind of nefarious in the Okaboji region. But so then when Abby was freed, there was no money for her because her sister had sold the cabin. So we wonder if that was part of it, if it was financial. And then her sister 
Abby went to live with her sister in Hampton, who immediately, two months later, kind of forced her to marry somebody. But, you know, nobody, everybody was starving. How do you live? You get married and you make it work. Any more questions? Yeah. You had an interesting statement about uh, Ink Peduta's uh, descendants. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them not wanting to really identify with him. Or what, what was his reputation amongst his descendants? Mm. Of yeah, and that's going to be another night here, I swear. <laughs> a lot of us are. Okay, Ink, um, a couple years ago, a book came out by Paul Beck on Ink Peruda, and it was like one of the first books that had been written about him in probably 25 years or something. And I spoke with Paul Beck doing some of my research. And first of all, he said, never, never, never make Ink Peruda out to be a good guy, because he was not. What he did was ruthless and terrible. However, he did it to protect his family and his way of life. And that's the same thing Leonard Littlefinger of Oglala told me. Um, and then when I was up in Flandreau, once by myself, I wanted to go to the Indian school and I'm at the guard cabin there trying to get past the guard and what do you want to do here? And I said, well, I'm doing research and on what? And Spirit Lake Massacre, well, he was an, a native gentleman and probably didn't appreciate me calling it that. But then he said, ah, Ink Paduta, huh? And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, Ink Paduta is quite the dude, wasn't he? And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then during Desert Storm, two of the Yank Yankton sold soldiers from Yankton, South Dakota, asked to have Ink Paduta as their nickname. So you're getting a feel for this. There's an undercurrent in the Lakota, Dakota people that he was a hero. Never got captured, never. And um, so back to Ink Paduta's descendants. Paul Beck said to me, I looked and looked and looked all over South Dakota for his descendants in North Dakota. He said he had 10 children. They, there must be hundreds and hundreds. Couldn't find anybody. Well, then he did find at one time one psychologist had worked with a child and said, well, we have to expect that from that child because his grandfather was Ink Paduta. That was in South Dakota. So he said, after my book was published and I treated him quite fairly and I probably presented a different side, they're coming out of the woods. <laughs> Woodwork. He said, they're everywhere. So, you know, I think once again, that's just right here. That's what makes it so fascinating. Um, there's that whole subculture thing going on. These guys are shaking their heads. Yes. <laughs> My mini series. How's it going, Dave? <laughs> um, okay, yeah, some of you in this room know that's that's a it's a dream, but honestly, I had two I have two gifted writers who are working on it, and the one writer is a native woman, and she's awesome in the way she writes. But there's a writer's strike right now in Hollywood, so nobody will do anything. And um, yeah, it's going to take a lot of money. We're going to have to find produce production company and all this kind of great stuff. And I've got feelers, and I'm just thrown into a whole new world that I've never thought I'd be in. But it's such a good story. I mean, it, it resonates today. How do you get past everything that's happening with our culture and the races? You have to forgive. And I mean, if she could forgive, and they could turn around and accept her, it's a perfect, perfect example of what history can do and can teach us. So, any more questions? Okay, thanks. Well, thanks, Anita. Uh, that gave us a, a really different perspective on, on what the Spirit Lake Massacre was, and it, it is a part of our local area and, and something we've all learned about throughout the years, so appreciate that. Thank you. Um, also, thank you all for attending tonight's presentation. One of the other things I'd like you for, to do right now is take a look up, and you can notice that we have new lights in here. And we're, we're happy for that. Uh, Terry Hoffmeyer and Hoffmeyer Electric uh, put in the new lights for us. So this, we think it's a good uh, 
an improvement, I guess you'd say, to our museum, and we're really appreciative of that. In addition, we're happy to announce that we received a grant for $5,000 for our country schoolhouse roof repair. And uh, so that's something else that we're really happy for and we can uh, continue to improve our facilities here. On another note, the uh, state's mobile history bus will be visiting our site on August 23. Along with the history bus, our museum will also be open free of charge from 2 to 8 p.m. So come on in and see what the history bus is like and, and also you have an opportunity to come and, and visit our museum and all the different buildings here. And as a final reminder, on Tuesday, September 19th, our very own Dutch American History Museum Vice President, Sarah Heiser, will present Over the Hill, a history of the Sioux County Poor Farm. So we're all looking forward to seeing and hearing uh, from Sarah that evening, and I'm sure it'll be a good presentation. And on the last thing I'd want, like to remind you of is before you leave, if you didn't have a chance already, feed the kitty on your way out. <laughs> Thank you.